I love you. Dill, dill, do, dill, 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 dill. Welcome back. We're on the couch. Hello. Dill, 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 dill. My name is the Faceless Leo. <laughs> and I'm the Green Cat. Uh, I'm the Green Traveler from the Gorge. I had a brain fart there. Brain just completely stopped working. You weren't expecting me to join in. I know. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a podcast about movies and TV, and we're back with our childhood memories. Yeah, Harry Potter. I was eleven by this point. Yeah, I, I guess we we could still consider that children, but yeah. man. They hardly look like children anymore. No, no, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they shot up so fast. They did, and and for some reason stopped wearing wizarding clothing and just started wearing clothes yeah. from Old Navy. Well, it's the third year. You stop caring after the third year. I don't know. For me, that was kind of the problem with this whole movie. We're talking Prisoners of Azkaban, the third Harry Potter film. The only book, once again, that I have read from the series. And it's a very good <laughs> Which book. Which is so weird. It's a good book. It is book. a good book. It's just hilarious that it's just like, of seven <laughs> books, you've read number three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just the way it happened. I, I know. I feel like I committed a, a horrible taboo, but like I was waiting for this third movie to come out, and I was like, I want to know the story. And people were like, well, you know she she wrote it already right and i was like all right what? i i guess i'll read it and then i picked up the third one people are like oh i didn't know that you read harry potter and i was like yeah this is the first one i'm reading and like what <laughs> <laughs> well i mean chris columbus did a you know a pretty loyal job in the first two movies so yeah. you do kind of get the the needed information so yeah it did jump right it on did in. feel like it 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 fit pretty well like i didn't feel like i was missing anything there was a couple of characters that i'm sure were in the first two books that i'm yeah. missing peeves the poltergeist right which why isn't he in the sh- i don't know i don't know he, I-, I mean he's just a he's just a clown character he just he just adds humor to the situation and like the right. movies don't really need that be, sure. you know because all the you know it's just they've kind of cut out everything that's unnecessary from the stories and have just left it as you know it's purest story form which is fine for a movie but it kind of sure. ruins the atmosphere and i think that's peas was one of the atmosphere pieces that is lost and it's really sad sure because he's just like, he's just funny at times there's there is a, a lot more humor at least punchy humor in this movie than there was in the last yeah. two and mm-hmm. uh, i was watching it and literal Sarah. punching humor <laughs> Yeah, yeah, literal punches. We got a couple of pretty good, uh, good smacks and punches in this movie for sure. But um, <clears throat> my wife said that uh, she really felt like that's what the first two movies were missing was that humor that's uh, in the book. Like she says mm. that uh, Harry's pretty sassy, and I wouldn't say he's necessarily more sassy in this this movie, but there is more humor. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and and I can agree with that. I think that is one of the key factors that this film gets that you know that improves on what the other ones did. But in regards to what it does to the overall overall universe, God, the this feeling. is where it goes south for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The atmosphere is lost here. It, it becomes so muggleized i should say like like it just feels like you know when, when you walk in into those first two movies when you walk into diagon alley or hogwarts or any of those beautiful set pieces it's like a whole new world it's so magnificent right. and everything feels so practical and real and kind of old day old timey and now when you go in when it like when it explores all these areas it just feels like a you know a very modernized movie for muggles like it, it just right. there's no magic anymore we're exploring the grounds of hogwarts and it's just beautiful landscapes that we can see whenever we want to and right. you know there's no new world to be explored here and in the which the is magic comes sad. across as gimmicky cuz that's when they they bring in hogsmeade in this in this uh, yeah story and i i feel like it could have used more of that that a feeling that Christopher Columbus 
or Chris Columbus, whichever, uh, established in those yeah. first two movies. I agree. Though I do like this movie. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I, I agree. I do like this movie. But like as you were saying with Hogmeade, Hogsmeade, the stores are kind of boring. Like yeah. when you see them, it's just kind of like, yeah, that's just a candy shop. Or yeah, that's just a, you know, a bar. The atmosphere is like, oh, but look, that, that broom is dusting itself across the floor. That cup's filling itself up at the tab. Right. And it's like, it just it's gimmicks now. It's no longer this practical, otherworldly beauty. It's just it's just like yeah, magic, yay, and like I don't know. It just yeah, and it just gets it gets worse in the franchise. And again, as you said, I like Prisoner of Azkaban because yeah. it's it's a it's a new taste at this or a new take at this world. It is really thrilling because Alfonso right. Cuarón is the director and. You know, I love Alfonso Cuaron. I don't know. I just feel like this is like the stepping stone to just bleh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, sp- I mean, we'll talk about it more in that next movie. But man, I the, uh, <clears throat> this this one, though, I did really enjoy. I still thought it was pretty loyal to the story anyways of the book. Mm. But you like, yeah, the atmosphere change is is a little bit jarring, especially if you're watching them back to back. I feel like with the amount of space there was in between the these two movies, like theater release wise, that it's not as jarring as if, like mm-hmm. I said, you just watched Chamber of Secrets yesterday and then you went to the theaters. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that right. would be a little bit strange. There is still like a darkness to to this, which I th- yeah. like. I think you know is established in in the first two as well, but now it's kind of just like. Where in those first two movies, it was a darkness that was paired with a freaking magical delight. And now it's just like very gray. And yeah. uh, I don't know exactly what the, it's like cloudy overcast now, <laughs> which exactly. I don't, I don't this, you know, I don't disapprove of it. It's just a different, it's just a different feel for the whole world. Yeah. I mean, again, it's just like, yeah, as you said, I don't disapprove of it, but like, by the time we got to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, I hate this movie for giving it that kind of bland boringness. Because this sure. movie is still lively and still fun and exciting. But as they've gone on, they haven't tried to, I don't know, reinvigorate it. Like, pump any right. kind of energy into this world. They've just kind of kept it at the same mundane world, you know, boring world building. And by the time they've gotten to movie 9 or 10, I'm just like, just fucking stop. Just turn this into a TV show and explore this sure. magical paradise once more. Go at it the way Chris Columbus did and make that a whole TV show because I really want to see that kind of energy just brought to this whole universe. Because Yeah, even the muggle world in those first two movies is very different from this feel. Yeah. Like, um, it, it still is like almost like a, a parody of the real world in those first two movies and and in this one it just feels like and maybe that's you know something that that they wanted to work on they wanted the real world to feel more like the real world so that the audience can Mm. feel dragged in a little bit more but i don't know i i i do miss the there was almost a you mentioned uh that they're dressed in old navy clothes and that yeah that was kind of weird and even when they are in the robes like when they when they're at haggard's class because he's he's a prof now and i like that but yeah when they're at haggard's class like the shirts are all half untucked and their their <laughs> their ties are never on right like come on guys they're in the rebellious code. stage yeah right oh that's ridiculous and it's interesting because the, even in the books, they don't always wear their school robes and everything. So it's just like, you know, it's it's weird right. seeing it on t- on the screen and being like, man, this just doesn't carry the same weight anymore. <laughs> right. And I, I feel like when Harry wore his street clothes in the first two movies, because they're always Dudley's hand-me-downs, they're all baggy mm. and loose and ratty on him. And I think that went to making the world different as as well mm-hmm. and now because he and dudley are drastically different sizes and somehow he has garnered more respect from the dursleys i don't know something 
they they buy him actual clothes or maybe he actually has money now so maybe he's buying his own clothes yeah they seem to have like a really let's get into it because that's the beginning of the movie is with the dursleys like always it's the same cast like nobody's changed except for except for albus dumbledore who's now played by michael gambin because richard harris passed earlier in the couple years ago in the making of this the big event at the beginning of the movie that incites everything is uh, Vernon Dursley's sister, Aunt Marge, I think, is coming over. That's right. And uh, Pam Ferris plays uh, this short role. Yeah, <laughs> this huge role, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> She's the worst. I hate her. I was so happy she right. this happened to her. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's it's weird that they kind of dumb down the brutishness of the Dursleys and just give it all to her because as right. you said like they're not they're not as mean to Harry they're still mean right. but they're not as mean because now she's the mean one now she comes in and she's the big bully right I mean it feels right for the 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 movie but at the same time you're just like I don't know just I, I, Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia were just so mean in the first two that seeing him right. here I was like why are they treating him kindly? Are they afraid of him? Like I'm, I, don't, I, don't know. I do think maybe, yeah, now that he has the capability to possibly blow them up, um, <laughs> uh, maybe they do, like, out of fear, treat him with a little bit more respect. But it's minimal. It's definitely minimal. But, man, Aunt Marge is just the fucking worst. Like, my God. <laughs> she's terrible. And she's, like, deliberately, yeah, deliberately pushing his buttons. And, like, Harry just snaps. He gets to the point where he accidentally does some magic. Was it an accident, though? <laughs> I mean, I think I don't think he intended to actually do things. I believe it was kind of just, like, a rage-induced. Like, he's going through puberty at this period. Yeah. You know, it's just, like, anything triggers your rage. And once you get that, that, that blood wrath in you, you're just kind of just like, ooh, I'm mad. Now I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to start screaming at somebody. I'm going to release my magic. I'm going to release it. (laughs) And (laughs) and because of underage wizarding laws, Harry goes on the run. He he packs his bags and flees from the Dursley's residence because he believes he is destined for prison and expulsion, I guess, from Hogwarts for breaking wizarding laws and everything. And he comes across, well, I guess before the night bus, he comes across the Grimm. He sees a big black dog stalking him. Yeah, big symbol throughout the the film. Yeah, and bigger in the books, even. Like, I feel like there was a lot lost in this movie, and in regards to... It was like every chapter he has an encounter of some kind. Yeah. Big or small. Exactly, and again, the, the, the movies cut out the unnecessary bits, but there's a lot of unnecessary in this book that the movie just kind of ignores and the the huge focus on the grim is one of those it just becomes kind of like a background omen that it's just like oh right. there it is again and he yeah. first meets it before he gets on the night bus which is this wildly chaotically driven transportation system that yeah. just like... i'm glad they didn't <laughs> i'm glad that that was yeah exactly because it it, that is definitely the the bit like one of the biggest hey this is a magical world tools used in this movie <laughs> exactly and i love it ernie the bus driver he's just he, blind old wizard he gets his directions from a shrunken head <laughs> <laughs> and i think That's he's nice. in doctor who if i'm uh, if Jimmy i'm not Gardner? mistaken yeah okay yeah yeah ernie is in yeah he's in he's in a couple of classic who episodes along with uh, michael gammon actually uh, dumbledore plays a character in a christmas special in in modern day who so oh, I yeah think i recall that more doctor who people coming i think it's a matt smith episode i'm just not entirely sure about that my memory gets kind of muddled when it comes to the christmas specials i've been re-watching the, the new who series and i i just got to the matt smith stuff nice um, and that first episode is adorable uh he's still my favorite man yeah i there's he just might be he might be mine too it's hard because you get to that period with david Tennant, who will meet in the next harry potter movie 
but you get to you get to David Tennant, Matt Smith, and then Peter Capaldi, and just like all three of them nail the role in a different right. way that it's really hard for right. me to choose between them which one I like the most. And the storytelling is completely different in all of them too. Well, Capaldi's yeah. story, Matt Smith's storytelling kind of bleeds into Capaldi's a little bit, but yeah, Stephen Moffat, yeah, and everybody, I just. I know we're not talking Doctor Who, but if any Doctor <laughs> Who fans are listening out there, which I know most of you are turning off right now, and I'm so sorry, but <laughs> I want Stephen Moffat back because I miss his storytelling. Like, I don't miss his storytelling, really, but I miss him being in charge of the show. And now we got Chris Chibnall, and it's just, I like Jodie Whittaker, but Chris Chibnall is just, I don't know what he's doing with the show, man. <laughs> it just feels yeah, I haven't caught off. up, so I can't, I can't weigh in, but I've heard yeah. things. So, anyways, where does the night bus take us? Yes. Uh, well, we meet Stanley Shunpike on the night bus, who in later books becomes a bigger character. Not oh, really? too big. Like He's just like mentioned like maybe three or four more times throughout the later books, but he's kind of just ignored. Yeah, he's a very small character, and say. It just He's just in this scene, it seems like. Oh, but I love him, though. He's such a like goofy little guy. And like I love the guy who who's playing him because he's just it was just this accent and like how Harry is just like doesn't know anything about what's going on in the wizarding world right now. He's yeah. like, What well, you don't know about any of this? <laughs> <laughs> uh Lee Ingleby. Thank you. Yeah, because he he informs Harry that Sirius Black is on the loose. And Sirius yeah. Black is a, an escaped prisoner from azkaban the, the, <gasps> the wizarding it. prison <gasps> the movie and that's what the whole that's the crux of the movie is Sirius black has escaped from prison and for whatever reason he's coming after harry potter because you know it is rumored and widely known through the public wizarding world that Sirius black was a huge follower of lord voldemort right. and because harry was was the cause of voldemort's downfall Sirius wants to get revenge i guess Right. And so that's that's the crux of the movie. Once they get to Hogwarts, because Harry's not expelled because he's fucking famous and famous people get away with shit, Harry gets to Hogwarts and Sirius Black comes looking for him. Yeah, he does. He comes a looking, and it's ominous. And yeah, I, I don't want to give away the ending. I don't know if we're gonna do a wall or anything, but I do feel like there is less foreshadowing than I would have liked towards Sirius's intentions i i feel like mm. there could have been a little bit more of that but the the twist is good there's a big twist in this in this movie slash book that when i read it was like oh shit <laughs> oh, right it's just mind-blowing you're just oh what the fuck whole time i don't know when yeah and the mystery of the book is really well built up because there's a lot to do with Harry's father in this book. Right. And it's it's really well delivered in the book and the mystery as I said is like really well built upon and it's it when it all comes together at the end it's so mind blowing and everything. And the movie cut as much of that as it thought was not necessary. Yeah, which was a lot. <laughs> and of just it, stuck sadly. to the bare bones mystery. Yeah. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, you don't really get much of anything with his father and then yeah. there's there's certain things at the end where it's just like why would you think this? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's one uh, thing in particular that that I was like, why didn't you? Like, that was, I feel like it was important, really. Um, yeah. So, night bus though eventually takes him to the Leaky Cauldron. That's in London. Oh, the Leaky Cauldron. That's in London. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you hear that, on? <laughs> oh oh my one. god. Uh, and there's some really good bits with Tom the innkeeper who uh, has a hunchback. Yeah. And also, like, I, I'm not sure, like, they're not clear in the movie, and I don't remember from the books, if he was not human, because he also has pointed ears. Oh. He's one of those weird changes that Alfonso Cuaron made to the, the atmosphere, because I believe they showed Tom in the first movie... Because Hagrid takes Harry to the Leaky Cauldron when they're on their way to Diagon Alley. And I think that barkeep, that he like walks into the door and he's, I think he calls him Tom. And it's like right. a completely different looking guy. That. Yeah, yeah. This Tom is played by Jim 
Tavare. And there's some pretty funny bits, but like it doesn't seem necessary for what's going on in the scene. Definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just fun. a it's just a weird little moment. It, another one of those weird changes is their Flitwick when they get to him because it's right. not called yeah. Flitwick, Flitwick in this. He's just the choir master or whatever the choir leader, but it's still Warwick Davis. He had he had a nice long beard. Yeah, he looked great in the old in the first two movies. Yeah, and but now he's got a mustache and his hair's jet black yeah it, do, it really doesn't make sense i, I don't know why they no that decision that's a weird decision well i think i think it's just he, they didn't have a role for professor flitwick like so when they were doing the choir master you know choir leader they're like oh why don't we just give that to warwick davis we like him we want to keep using him so he, you know he's a great actor but make him look like Flitwick. <laughs> yeah, just just go ahead and make him Flitwick. But for whatever reason, they don't do that, and they they change him completely. And then the rest of the franchise is like, yeah, we're gonna keep that look as Flitwick. And it's like, what? No. <laughs> like, Jeez, go yeah. back to how Flitwick so looked. Weird. He looked much better. Yeah, and, and like you know, you get used to it as the movies go on. But it's just such a weird change. Yeah. Anyhow, back at the Leaky Cauldron, Robert Hardy was in the last movie i believe as cornelius fudge but just a very very small part and cornelius fudge he's with the ministry of magic i don't remember what exactly his title is but the minister of magic oh he is the minister anyhow he becomes a much more prevalent character as the movies go on but in this particular scene he is very quickly trying to go through this scene with harry and he's like oh you know ants get blown up all the time (laughs) yeah yeah he's like we wouldn't we wouldn't expel every student from hogwarts just for blowing up their ants right it's like no i'm I'm pretty sure if neville had done this (laughs) (laughs) yeah right but but i mean come on (laughs) it's because it's harry potter yeah it's because he's rich and famous and, and Cornelius is looking at that as like, you know, he's like, he's got an endless amount of money in his bank vault. You know, once that kid's old enough, you know, he could be a great asset to the ministry. I got to nurture this while it's young. For certain. I feel like in this scene, too, is when Robert is like, don't wander around at night. There's a murderer on the loose. But he's definitely <laughs> yeah. trying to keep it. He's trying to play it pretty low yeah. on how serious serious is. <laughs> haha you did it did. and it's interesting because it's like it's one of those moments where they're they're trying to keep information away from the kid you know they're just right. like this child is too young to handle such delicate information and like cornelius just doesn't know harry so he's just yeah. like he doesn't have any idea of what harry's capable of knowing which is nice because later on ron's father when he when he comes into the picture which is very shortly, but he, he pulls Harry aside. And he's just like, Harry, I have to talk to you about Sirius Black because he is, he has a personal vendetta against you. And I don't know how much right. Arthur Weasley knew of Sirius's backstory, like how much he knew of the, the friendship that Sirius and Harry's father had together. But, you know, he, he at least was like, I know Harry is more capable of knowing the details than, you know, what Cornelius right. Fudge is like. Cornelius is like, I got to protect this kid. Arthur's like, I gotta protect this kid, but in a different way because he knows Harry's personality. He knows Harry yeah, is gonna. Yeah, Harry's gonna look into it. Yeah. So he might as well have more information. Yeah. Which I really appreciate our Arthur Weasley's character for that. Like he, the adults in this world, you know, there's a few exceptions like Hagrid and, and Dumbledore, but the adults in this world do not put a lot of faith in the the younger uh, people. And which, you know, kind of reflects the real world. I I Mm. feel like when things happen, you should inform your children because they're going to know that something's wrong. But you keeping it from them is just going to I think it just puts a a wall of distrust. It separates you from your your children more. So I, I think it's important to explain when things happen to your kids. Um, It might be hard for them to understand or deal with but at least they're dealing with it instead of thinking that there's just things that because you know it's just i feel like it's a a lie that we've 
that generations have been telling themselves that children don't understand things but really they, they do yeah they're, they're they really do they're assholes but they're people <laughs> and, <laughs> and i think that's another aspect that's kind of lost from the movies and it's not a fault to the movie it's more just a fault to the the style of a movie you know the 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 short nature of telling a story versus right. whereas with a television show you could do this over seven years but i think the 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 relationship between harry and ron's parents is just kind of lost because they are kind of like a foster parents for him right, right you know in the books in the books he describes them as like a mother and father that he never knew you know right. or that he didn't know in a way family. yeah yeah because because they care for him so much like parents that he's never had before because he's always right. had just the dursleys and their assholishness so it's just that that, that 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 scene is one of those scenes that i really like because it, it finally is just like oh right he is a parental figure for harry and it's just it's right. just a nice little moment and it, it comes after Harry just starts staying at Hogsmeade, not Hogsmeade, uh, uh, Diagon leaky, Alley for a little while. Yeah, the leaky cauldron. Yeah, because he's got to wait there until school starts because the Dursleys don't want him back after yeah. after the yeah. incident he caused. And he comes across Ron and Hermione there too, mm-hmm. who are fighting constantly, like the beautiful couple that they are. Yeah. I I don't think that's really a big spoiler. I think it's it it, it gets set up pretty early. I think, though I did mm-hmm. I did a little bit. I guess in those early movies, suspect that Ron and uh, no, excuse me, Harry and Hermione would get together. I did have that. Oh, I was thinking Ron and Harry, but Ron and Harry <laughs> mm-hmm. thinking Ron and Harry. I could see it. Yeah, uh, they definitely do have a very loving relationship. This is the movie though where they start exploring ron and hermione being a couple uh right. just subtly there's no there's no like actual yeah there's like i'm scared i'm gonna hold your hand and and stuff yeah like exactly yeah. and it's just a cute little moment where they both like grab hands and then look at each other like what no <laughs> cuties <laughs> and they're really like they're like the actors are really too old to really be acting that way about it <laughs> right but it's right. hilarious <laughs> uh, yeah because so, they're supposed to be 13 in this movie but by this time they're both they're all like well i don't know 16 or 17 acting mm-hmm. i don't know how old they were when they started i don't know uh they were pretty young in that first movie but there is a lot of time in between the filming of these uh this movie and the other two i feel like yeah well this came out 2004 so was, this would be like four years after the first or three years after the first yeah they just hit puberty like crazy they sure did but anyhow what's what we should probably move on to the train i think because that's a very important scene yeah i guess we're kind of running on time i think but anyhow in that train we get introduced to two things at the same time a consistent villain uh, or force anyways a dark force throughout Mm. this film and our new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. And the best one throughout the and entire series. And the best series. one, yes. Hands down. Hands down. Uh, I love Lupin, Remus Lupin. Played by David Thewlis. Yes, who's just about in everything, like all these other actors. <laughs> yeah. Or not Doctor Who, to my knowledge. The Dementors show up. Yeah. They're searching the, the plane. They are wardens, or guards, of Azkaban and they're searching Mm -hmm. for Sirius and they come and they search the plane and they go to search Harry's cabin and they're like sucking the shit out of them oh you should yeah you should (laughs) you should explain that a little bit they suck (laughs) they suck all the happiness out of a room they don't just they don't just uh get down on their their robed (laughs) their robed dementors kiss (laughs) oh my (laughs) Uh well yeah JK, anyhow, JK was having a blast writing about these guys I bet yeah so Harry passes out uh, it has a very strong effect on him and uh-huh. uh, Remus gets the Dementor to get to stop sucking on him and uh, <laughs> then he gives the then he gives his student a little bit of chocolate he's like here this will make it better <laughs> <laughs> this does help Harry but. This theme of the Dementors really affecting him just keeps on coming up through the entire book. Yeah. Kind of like, and there's a couple of scenes where the grim image 
the grim symbol happens at the same time uh, as yeah. one of these dementor scenes and they really parallel well especially given what the grim symbol comes to mean later that's that's kind of what i wanted to say about the train yeah yeah because you get the dementors who are very good villains in my opinion because they're yeah. they're creepy they're they got the whispery uh whispery cloaks that kind of just flutter off away from them and it's it's very ominous and when you get that close-up yeah. shot of their hands and it's like dead flesh and right. they're, they're i mean even when you, you get like one good shot of their mouths and it's like again it's just a, a hole and it's just it's gross and it's ooey yeah. and it's there's some teeth in there yeah, yeah. maybe i don't know because it's like you don't yeah. really get that good of a look and it's like i don't know if those are teeth or i don't know if that's like yeah something what it is those soul suckers and it's 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 very beautiful design when they pop up it, it's very horrific at times because there's like there's a there's a quidditch match where there's just right. there's a huge storm going on and it's just like you just see the their their cloaks kind of just flapping in the the wind like really far away and it's just it's very disturbing and its effect on Harry and he and how he hears like screaming when they're around for kids it's like it's a very good scare and I mean as an adult it's still really thrilling it's no longer scary but like you know right. it's, it still carries that intimidating feel right and it's a completely new and totally different element of this world that that we haven't gotten before and um, mm-hmm. it's like I would imagine a prison system that had these as their guards would be very effective. Yeah. The fact that Sirius escaped, the the improbability of that is elevated by the introduction of these creatures. Yeah. Because it's like, how could somebody escape this, you know, these people who just instill fear within you? And the sad part of this whole movie is they don't really talk about it. They don't explain how Sirius escaped. They... They give you the information that's in the book, right? But they don't explicitly tell you, which it's not necessary because, again, we always complain. Well, at least I always complain when there's too much exposition, right? But that, I feel like that's a a key factor that is kind of needed in a film like this. Is like if you're gonna constantly say like, "How could he escape from Azkaban? No wizards ever escape from Azkaban," right? And then you literally don't tell people how he escaped from Azkaban. It's gonna just right. like the fuck, like, guys. Like on. you said, though, the information is there for you to pick up if you're a uh, an attentive viewer but yeah it's never explicitly said how that happens and unless we go behind a wall later i don't think we should give it away because yeah. it is it is a big part of the twist too yeah i agree and from there from the train you know you're back at hogwarts where you have this new Harry or this new Albus Dumbledore who is uh, delivered his very first scene is just kind of nonchalant. They're just kind of like, this is it. We're not going to go in it any further. Right. He stood up, he gives a speech and you're, you're just kind of like, as the viewer, you're like, okay, this is the new Dumbledore. We're not going to have a big, big to do about the change in the looks or anything. We're just going right. to do it. And I, I appreciated that because to, to do anything otherwise would have been a little disrespectful to Richard Harris's, memory in my opinion i do appreciate that they didn't put him in in richard harris's costume i i i I really appreciate his his new look and in fact when i was sarah's family took us to uh the wizarding world of harry potter i don't think that's what it's called in in orlando but uh at universal land or whatever (laughs) universal studios but anyways Uh, I did, as my souvenir, buy that hat that he wears. Um, nice. and, and I wear it sometimes when I play D&D because, you know, nerd. And yeah. it's a it's a beautiful hat. It's like something that you would sleep in, really, or like wear while you're smoking your pipe tobacco in your smoking robe. <laughs> uh, I love it. It's a good hat. It's, 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 it's flat on top. It's almost Fez-like. I don't know what you would call the yeah. hat, but I love it. It's got a tassel on top. Yeah. <laughs> it is it is a beautiful costume because again yeah. as you said it it's respectful to richard harris it's a different costume he's not acting the same he's a more lively and mm. mysterious dumbledore i would say Definitely. less grandfatherly more off-putting there's there's just there's a there's a snarky attitude to this dumbledore you know it's just like 
you can understand why Voldemort would still be afraid of this Dumbledore because there's still right. a lot of energy burning in this guy. Yeah. And, I, and that's not I, to discredit Richard Harris because, as I said in the other ones, I would have really loved to see those battle scenes with Richard Harris versus yeah. Voldemort because you would have seen a much different act. I feel like you would have, you know, right. you would have seen the fire from Richard Harris when he's mad. You just never got to see him get mad yet. Yeah. And yeah. so I just, it I wanted to really see that. I wanted to see where, it, where they would have went with it. Yeah. But, and, and, and that's also on the reverse of that, not to discredit what Michael Gambon does with, with the character because yes. he does a good job. But in this particular movie, I do think also to respect Richard Harris, he's a little underutilized. I felt like there was more of him in the book. Michael Gambon was underutilized? Yeah, I, at least the Dumbledore character in general. There's like two major scenes with Dumbledore mm. in this movie, and that's it. Because, yeah. you know, they couldn't have done those scenes without him. There is one scene. So there's a moment where Sirius Black breaks into Hogwarts. Uh, you know, the Dementors are kept off the grounds by Dumbledore's orders. He doesn't want them on the grounds because right. he doesn't believe in that kind of supervision. Intrusion, real. Intrusion, yes. Thank you. When Dumb when Sirius Black breaks in, though, you know, all the students are like corralled into one room to sleep together while the teachers search the grounds and try to find Sirius Black. And while the students are sleeping there together, Snape and Dumbledore are just walking along, expositing. Like, this is one of those moments where it's just like exposition is just delivered so poorly. Yeah. And they're like explaining things about Sirius Pot or Sirius Black while harry is sleeping like two feet away from them and they're looking at him talking about him and it's like right. guys even if he's asleep why the fuck are you talking about this right next to them because yeah. the possibility that he's awake which he is and listening yeah. in on your conversation i feel like dumbledore knows he's awake though i i feel like but but the but the thing is though what's poorly done about that that scene you're talking about is that uh, Snape does say, should we inform Potter? And he says, perhaps, <laughs> but let him rest for now. And it's like, come on, Dumbledore, you've got to know he's awake. He's like the nosiest you know kid in the school. <laughs> right. And Dumbledore knows everything. When Harry's in yeah, an invisibility yeah. cloak, he's like, I know Harry's there. And it's just yeah. like, come on, you know he's awake. You know what the fuck you guys are talking about. And... I don't know if that information is still something that you should just deliver to a child, you know, it's like, or talk about around a child. I right. mean, you want to be open with them, but the stuff they were talking about, it's kind of just like, don't question a child's ability to do something or like whether or not you right. should tell them something right in front of the child. Like, it makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. And like the only, I feel like the only thing that could get managed from Harry hearing Dumbledore saying that is that Dumbledore doesn't think it's important enough to wake harry up about it yeah yeah and and so yeah i just you're like you said it was just poorly delivered so i think maybe we should jump to the first the first class for the the dark arts the defense against the dark arts teacher so they start learning how to defend themselves against boggarts which are kind of similar to the dementors that they use fear against their enemy except for they're like a, a level two D and D character. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they, they pop out of the closet and they reflect your fear. And there's an easy charm. You just say ridiculous and think of something funny <laughs> and then they're diffused. And, uh, there's this great bit. Like, so the first time he walks out, it's Alan, Alan Rickman as Snape. And because, yeah. uh, because, Neville is a <laughs> super Terrified afraid of Snape. Snape. And uh, then he imagines him in his uh, grandmother's clothing, and it, it's it's fucking great. Like, he has this little yeah. red purse and everything. It's... <laughs> I love Alan Rickman, man. Yeah, he's so good. It comes to Harry. Both he and the professor thought that Voldemort would walk out of the closet, but it's a Dementor, and Harry doesn't mm. know what to do about it. And uh, it's a big character moment for Harry. Like later on, uh, Professor Lupin is, is like, I think it just shows that your greatest fear is fear itself. And that's very wise. 
that's very FDR. <laughs> yes. They would have loved you back in the Great Wars. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else, what else should we talk about? I feel I I feel like we set up the the plot of the movie. Well, I think there's uh there's three thing three people specifically, well, four people actually that we should talk about and like I think we should just keep building off of Lupin because he is such a good teacher. Right. And they slightly hint at his relationship again with Harry's father because this whole book is really uh it's it, it really is just like Harry's connections with his dad. You know, it's just right. like it, it builds a lot of his father's backstory and and his father as like a hero in Harry's eyes. And this movie kind of kind of does that. It it really just kind of touches on that. And Lupin kind of is like a fatherly character throughout the first act of this film or the first two acts of this film, more just the second act. But but they kind of touch on Lupin's relationship with his father and how he knew Harry's dad when they were both in school and Harry's kind of like going to him for like, you know, can you tell me a story of my dad? You know, and it's kind of like right. they don't really do that, but that's kind of how it feels. Yeah. And that's what makes Lupin such a great fucking teacher is just like it just how he treats the kids you know he he really is just right. kind of like brewing them to be good wizards you know he's just he's just a good teacher he's just especially if you compare him to the other two dark arts teachers yeah i mean like quarrel is that right that's not right quarrel squirrel without the s okay it is. okay professor quarrel he, he is just like stand up there and stutter through a lecture and that was his style of teaching and gilderoy or whatever his name is just up there really talking about himself i don't think anybody learned anything that year in that class no no uh, and to be yeah. fair they may have learned something in quarrels we never actually saw That's one true. of his we, we interrupted you right. know mcgonagall and harry interrupted a lecture where he was like he had like an iguana or a komodo dragon or something like around his neck uh, two very different lizards i just listed off yeah. there <laughs> i think it is an iguana and, but it, who knows it could have been some kind of magical creature uh that they the, right like the tarantula in the james bond movie <laughs> like i i feel like there is uh there there was something to his lectures we just never got to see him but lupins are just they're fun they seem to actually make you interested in learning and you know, he, he if somebody had like a question or something, he seemed like interested in developing that into a lecture. I don't know. I really I really just loved Professor Lupin as the as the teacher. Yeah, I would have loved to take his class for sure. And it's just it's one of the sad things that, you know, that curse is looming over this whole movie. And you're just like, hmm, what's going to happen? Another, I guess, uh, to jump off of him to the other people, I, I think we should talk about the other teacher that's introduced in this film is Professor Trelawney played amazingly by emma thompson she is super fun she's the uh the the divination teacher right yes she does play a, yeah. an important role i think more important in the book than in the yeah. movie but yeah she yeah. is very interesting i love her thick ass glasses just about as blind yeah. as uh as the bus driver as any of the bus driver but mm. she is supposed to be so entombed with with yeah i guess divination is the right the right term mm-hmm. and hermione's just like this is the fakest bullshit i've ever heard in my life <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah hermione's just like pops up and she's like i'm getting the fuck out of here this is stupid yeah. and and for the most part it is just bullshitting for you go throughout most of the movie thinking like yeah this woman is not at all in tuned with divination in any way and you're like what was dumbledore thinking giving her this job and then you get one moment at the near the near the third act where you're like, oh, you know, there oh, is there is yeah. an actual power here. There is there is something. And but Emma Emma Thompson as Trelawney is just one of the greatest. I mean, again, yeah. they, they they nail their casting decisions so well throughout this entire series, this franchise. And she's one of my favorites because she's she's such a small cat character. You know, she has she yeah. has like a, maybe a five to ten minute part, and her contribution is just golden. It's it's just I love I love it. Yeah, and and and, and the relationship between her and the three main characters is is pretty great too. Like, yeah, she for some reason thinks Ron is really in touch with the gift, <laughs> <laughs> but Ron's just like, 
Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but and he's like flipping through his book. <laughs> He and, don't know and shit. <laughs> he doesn't know shit. And then you know she does not like Hermione for this, you know, because Hermione doesn't like her probably, and she just. And Harry's destined to die. Yes, and Harry, yeah, she. Oh yeah, she cannot stop prophesizing about Harry's death, which like that's what he needs. <laughs> yeah. Right, and it's not focused on at all in the movie, but like in the books, it's mentioned that she does that with every like throughout every year is that every year she chooses one student who's going to die apparently like <laughs> tells him, and she's like well which one of you saw the grim this time and like i just it's one of those hilarious things in the book that reading as an adult you're like yeah that would be what i would probably do as a teacher if i was a teacher of divination i'd be like well, one of you is destined for doom this year Ooh, you know, it's just like, Who is it? It, she probably did uh pick out Moni Myrtle though oh well she might not have been a professor <laughs> that would have been great though she yeah. if she did no I don't think she was but it would have been hilarious uh the other two people that we should talk about going off of Harry's father and Lupin were the other two makers of the the Marauders map which we haven't talked about either but yeah that's important uh, in uh, the story Yeah, and those two people are Sirius Black himself, played superbly by Gary Oldman, yep. and Peter Pettigrew, who I did not sadly write the name down. Who plays Peter Pettigrew? Well, he he's dead, Greg. He's dead. Don't fucking do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, I mean, that's just... You know, yes, uh, okay, yeah. spoilers. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's in a, a flashback scene when he's yeah, not dead. That's right. Yeah, in a flashback, he's played by, uh, and, and he's in it. He's another guy who's like in fucking everything. Timothy Spall. Yeah, I mean, he's in uh, Sweeney Todd also. I mean, there's a lot of crossovers with Sweeney Todd and Harry Potter. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. He plays Churchill in uh, the King's Speech too, and that's a fantastic movie. Oh but, yeah. yeah. I forgot he was in that. Yeah, that is great. That that's another one that has a lot of Harry Potter crossovers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Timothy yeah. Spall and Helena Bonham Carter. <laughs> Anyways, when they come up into the story, when Sirius Black and Peter Pettigrew are introduced, it's really wild fun. That's when the, I, I really right. I love the I love the third act of this movie. It's just yeah, it's, it's good. You don't know what's gonna happen because it's like when when it happens, you're just like, oh shit, this is crazy. How is there still thirty minutes left? And then you know they they introduce another aspect of the film which is hermione's little secret i will say that hermione's just getting to a lot of different classes throughout the entire show or throughout the entire movie yeah there's a big running gag where ron's like did did you see her come in here huh yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's my rupert grant impression (laughs) yeah it's beautiful it's it's spot on and oh, yeah she just pops up in all classes and they're just like how did she get in here she wasn't with us when we came to this class and and when you find out at the end what's going on it's it just adds another layer to the story that it's just like right. you, you wouldn't expect it from a harry potter film in my exactly. opinion like if, yeah. if i hadn't read the books i would not expect a harry potter movie to go this route right and especially at, at, at where the story is when it happens when it's revealed you're like oh man this story is done and it's awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I, can't, I can't believe this is how it ends. It's like, oh man, I'm so I'm so torn and upset. And it's just like, now hold on a second, kid. There's still twenty to thirty minutes left. And yeah, it's just like, yeah. what? So that's a good part of the story. Um, those four friends, and they make the Marauders map together. And the Marauders mm-hmm. map is such a big part of the plot in this this movie and and the book as well. But they don't mention that it was them like the yeah. book like so the front of the map says who made it but it's their nicknames it's their their hogwarts school day yeah. nicknames and it just does not mention that they they made it and i feel like that was such an important connection for harry to learn and they just they just right. completely leave it out it's, it's another one of those things where they give you all the information you need but they don't tell it to you explicitly. Right. And it's like... That one's a little bit harder to find out. Yeah, but I think Lupin says one point, he's like, I made it. Or like, I was one of the people who made it. Because I think Lupin says that he did it. And so it's like, you're given that 
that detail, which right. from that you can be like, oh, right, from what he's told Harry about the stories of his dad, maybe his dad also made it. And from what you find out with Harry and Sirius, maybe Sirius also made it. And so it's like, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things where it's a detail, I, it's, it's a piece of exposition that I think is needed. Right. The 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 Dumbledore and Snape walking about talking deeply, you know, while the stars of Hogwarts Castle kind of shine above them while they're all sleeping. That stuff's not needed. It's it's funny and it it makes it more, you know, it builds the tension a little bit. But that's the stuff that's not needed. And the stuff that I think would have been nicer, the 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 build up of Harry's relationship with his dad is just kind of tossed away and it's yeah, it is. I don't know. It's kind of um, sad. So I do not think today we're going to have time to really dive into spoilers, yeah. which I'm sorry if, you, if you've been listening and we're waiting for that. <laughs> but there are two more things that I would like to talk about a little bit. One is Patronus, which is something that people talk about outside of like the storyline of Harry Potter because it's like, Oh, what would your Patronus be? And, and what does that mean? Yeah, so uh, the Patronus is what you use to drive away a Dementor. It's a, it's a very complicated spell that immediately becomes not complicated throughout the rest of the show uh-huh. or the yeah. franchise. You know, it's, it's kind of like in, uh, in Dragon Ball Z where it's just like, oh, you're going to have to get to such power level to beat this guy. And then the next story arc, it's like, oh, you've become, you know, 15 times that power level. And now you got to go 20 times more to beat Frieza. And it's just like, it, it, power levels mean nothing after a while. And it's like, Who why do we even introduce it? Me, uh. Exactly. And that's how it is with, with Harry Potter and the Patronus. Is it's supposed to be very complicated. You won't be able to master it. And when you produce a Patronus, it takes on a shape. And I don't really know if there's much meaning actually behind the shape. I don't think JK really put thought into it. She was just like, this right. is a cool feature. And it damn well is a cool feature. And mine yes. 100% would be a sloth. If I would yes. cast the Patronus, it would be a, it would be a, just a, a sloth that would come out of my wand and just like look at the Dementors. And they would just be like, right. I we going to chill. I think mine would probably be a bear, but it would yeah. like, it would like immediately roar. And then, like, go to cl- lick its claws because it, it doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I didn't, we, didn't we determine once it was a sun bear? It was one of those, yeah, just, like, comes down and just, like, scratches yeah, yeah. its belly, and it's like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna good. just sit here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it would do. Well, I was, that, that was it. just something fun I wanted to talk about. But the other character that I think is worth mentioning is our, our noble hippogriff, Buckbeak. And oh just, yeah it's just a, another great tie for hagrid in this movie his his love of animals and he he mm. finally gets the opportunity to do something more for hogwarts than just be the groundskeeper the last movie his name gets cleared and now dumbledore says be a professor you you know mm. just about everything there is to know about magical creatures impart your knowledge onto the the children and the first lesson and i think here in comes hagrid's biggest mistake is that the first yeah. <laughs> lesson is how to ride a hippogriff um and that just yep. seems like really advanced <laughs> <laughs> and it, it makes me wonder too when harry is riding the hippogriff when he's flying around what's hagrid doing is he teaching right yeah, exactly. And Harry's missing that part of the lesson. Right? Yeah, watch Harry fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, everybody shut up. I need to pay attention in case Harry falls off. He's like, I can't right. use magic. So I can't actually like protect Harry if he falls to the ground. But right. I gotta I gotta keep careful eye here. Which is another thing now that I think about it. When when Harry's falling in the Quidditch match where the Dementors show up. Right. Dumbledore just points at him and stops him. Dumbledore doesn't even use a wand. He just like raises his hand wow. and points. And he's like, mm. arresto momentum. And Harry slows down. I'm like, does Dumbledore not fucking need a wand? Like, is he so well, badass maybe, in the movies that... I mean, this might be a bit of a spoiler, but maybe the Elder Wand just imparts so much power onto you that, Ooh, maybe. that he's able to cast without it. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I'd like that. I'd like that a lot. But but imagine though, if if going back to Buckbeak, imagine if Chris Columbus was still doing this 
and we had gotten something more practical like again just to harken back to never ending oh, story imagine if we had gotten the beast like that yeah. and I, I like their buck beak i do like the cgi'd it's not hippogriff bad. that the yeah. that we got it's not no and and watching somebody fly on it is really fun and one of those like nice magical moments of this film one, one of the few magical moments of this film but man, it really would have been cool to see a practical creature, like some weird practical would, effect yeah. that yeah. I don't know. Especially with that 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 basilisk from the last movie, like you know, th- there's definitely some CGI parts with that. But when it's mm-hmm. when you're really up close to it, that was a real practical physical object. It was daunting. Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, you're right. They could have done some kind of like Jim Henson shit and. It would have been cool. Yeah, I just I would have loved it if they just continued with that the Jim Henson feel. If they would have just continued with the the Muppet, the animatronic styled creatures, that would have just I don't know. It just another aspect of the atmosphere that's just lost for me. And yeah. I'm remembering another thing that I wanted to jump back to with uh, a <laughs> just stream of consciousness day for me to jump back to uh, the Marauders map. It's a it's a it's a plot hole that's constantly pointed out by everybody on the internet, and I wanted to touch upon it because the Marauders map I don't know if we mentioned shows everybody's location in Hogwarts. You know, you you open up the map, you you cast the spell on it, and it shows you where people are, where they're walking to, you know, what they're doing, and you're left to wonder because the Marauders map was originally in possession of George and Fred Weasley. Whenever they looked at the map, why didn't they mention anything about Ronald Weasley sleeping with Peter Pettigrew? Yeah. Because he's, he's sleeping with them. He, he's always with Scabbers, who you find out is Peter Pettigrew. And why are, why are Fred and George just like, you know, just, they open the map and be like, yeah, Ron's in his bedroom. Oh, and he's sleeping with that Peter Pettigrew guy again. And it's like, are they huh. really just very, very good brothers? And like, we're not going to question our brothers, uh... You know, hey, sexual you know, choices. We'll let him come out to mom and dad when he wants. You know, and also, you know, us mentioning it would cue people in that we have this map, and then there right. would be no more fun. And exactly, and it, it's it's nice that they think that way. Way, but at, then at the same time, you're left wondering: there's not that many kids in Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah. You would know who this Peter Pettigrew is, and you would That's also true. know. I mean, Harry doesn't know because he's not part of the world, but a lot of people know who Peter Pettigrew is just from the stories of Sirius Black and right. the, the Lord Voldemort days. So they would probably know who he is. So it's like, what the fuck is going on there? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a real, real weird plot hole. You're right. You're right. It is a plot hole. But maybe, though, you know, because when they do use the map, they are pretty focused on whatever mischief that they're going in for. So maybe they open mm-hmm. up the map. They're not even looking for where Ron is. They're looking at yeah. Like the map is pretty big when you have it all unfolded. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have we have a copy of it, and there's only three of us in the house, so it's kind of boring. But <laughs> with the Hogwarts version of it, <laughs> uh, there's so many people on it. Maybe they just didn't notice. But yeah, you're right. It, they they shouldn't have. Yeah, they should. That's all I gotta say. Because about I don't know. I I feel like if I don't I don't want to like seem like a creep but it's like i feel like i would have if i was at hogwarts and my brother was there and i was like oh i'm about to perform some mischief or do something you know i, I feel like just out of pure nature i would just check to make sure that he was asleep and healthy and fine in his bed or something right it's like oh is he okay right. yeah he is in his bedroom all right he's fine you know it's just, yeah. i don't know it's just one of those things that and i guess they do have like six fucking siblings so maybe they just they're like fuck him <laughs> well, you don't care about him anymore but yeah, Fred and George only care about Fred and George. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's been that's the Prisoner of Azkaban. I think so. What you got for closing like, statements? Well, I mean, I want to apologize again. I know, I know, I've been scatterbrained today. It's been all over the place. It's daylight. We, we're filming this on daylight savings time, so I feel like I've lost a whole hour and like yeah, everything's just I thrown think, off for me. I I don't know if they do that in any other country but America, but it it's stupid. It's a twenty first century. It's, I think though that this is yeah, the time that we should choose though. You know, make it later. Stay on this time. Make it lighter later year round. 
yeah. especially in the winter. Yeah, like we change that. it back in the winter. Like I don't mind sleeping in for that half an hour for that hour. Excuse me. But why does it need to be darker later? It's just I don't feel like we yeah. have a reason for it anymore. No, it's just dumb, man. It's just dumb. And it's throwing my day off and I'm like I was getting into a very creative mood and then that kind of stalled and now I'm, sure. now we did this and it's just like I'm making excuses for my I've been sleepy somberness all today. Yeah, right. I I, but, I I think there's something to that. It's also colder though than it was. <laughs> yesterday yeah it was yeah so uh closing statements for prisoner of azkaban i do love it i know i know it seems like i'm harping on the atmosphere of it and attacking it but it's more of one one of those things where it's like this is a stepping stone and i don't hate it i don't fault it because alfonso Caron was handed this project and asked to make changes richard harris passed away you have to get a new dumbledore this new dumbledore is going to have a different attitude and, you know, you also don't want to just steal another director's art style. Like, Chris Chris Columbus was still a producer, but he, he had stepped down. He didn't want to direct anymore. Or maybe he did want to direct. I don't, I don't know the reason for why he stepped down. But he still was a producer. So I imagine it was a friendly step down. And so Alfonso Cuaron comes in, and he has a very unique directing style. And he's not going to change his style right. to accommodate another director. So I, I completely understand it. And... For this movie, those changes are great. The atmosphere is still dark. It's still fantastical and magical. And even if it is more modern, muggleized, it's 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 still a Harry Potter movie to, for me. And so I give it three and a half stars. You know, I still I still really do enjoy it. Yeah, I I I agree with everything that you say. When I went to see this movie, I was definitely the most excited to see this movie out of the other two because I'd actually read the book. And then yeah. it was, there's some things that I wish that made it from the book into the movie, but it definitely is true to the book and I loved it. So for that reason, I didn't really care about the atmosphere change a little bit, except for like the minor things like why is Flitwick different and, and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. But yeah, definitely a full face movie. You guys should check it out. It does have better scores like rotten tomatoes and metacredit wise than the first two. Oh, gotcha yeah and and i yeah people people loved this one like there yeah, was there was a lot of critics who came out saying this was the best harry potter of the franchise that it did so much more magic than the first two and it's like looking back on it i don't get it this is one of yeah. those areas where i just differ from the critics where it's like they were hugely praising this film and i'm walking away from it thinking like man i wish they had continued with that that 90s yeah. feel that that because because i was saying i mentioned earlier that you know the other two felt grittier and it, it's sure. more of like the quality of it feels grittier it's not worse it's just you know there's there's just a ruggedness to it and this one just feels like that disney polish you sure. know it feels like another company came in took that grid out of it and it was just like we're gonna keep it dark but we're gonna you know we're gonna polish it a little bit right. so it looks and nicer. i think yeah i think that the punchy humor really does change the atmosphere too like i feel like some people felt yeah. like the the humor was missing from those first two movies which you know yeah there, there is a lot of humor in the books so i i can i can understand that as a loyal fan feeling that way but i just like you said there's just so much such a much more magical otherworldliness in those other two movies than there was in this one but i think that's yeah I think this is what we got time for today. It's a great movie. Like we said, you should check it out. And um, you got anything else to say, Green? No, I'm, I'm, I've been the Green Traveler from Gorsh. And I am the Faceless Leon. Yeah, I've been struggling with the, the potatoes. I keep on going back and forth, and but they sure are tasty. Go eat one today. <laughs> eat yourself today. <laughs> Safe travels and good night. Green and Faceless on the Couch is a proud production of Fiction Works 19. If you like the show, please show your support by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Like, follow, subscribe, wherever you might listen. We also now have a Patreon account. If you feel so inclined to support us in a financial manner, please become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash greenandfaceless. You can also find more information about us on our Facebook account or on the FictionWorks19 Instagram account. Thank you so much 
for listening.